Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Luigi Zingales, uh, the faculty director of the Stiegel Center and the co-host of the podcast, Capital Isn't. Today, we're delighted to continue the Stiegel Center Monopolies and Politics workshop series with uh, Steve Haber and Richard John on whether and how the US is an exception to what we've seen so far in other countries in terms of the relationship between monopolies and politics. After the discussion, the last 15 minutes will be devoted to question and answer, so please submit your question with a Q&A button on Zoom. Before we begin, allow me to briefly introduce our guest. Steve Aver is the AA and Jen Welch Milligan Professor of the School of Humanities and Science and the Peter and Ellen Bing Senior Fellow of the Hoover Institute, all of that at Stanford University. He's also a senior fellow at various institutions and his research spans from multiple disciplines, across multiple disciplines, including, including comparative politics, financial economics, and economic history. And he has recently written a very interesting book on the history of regulation in banking. And um, his paper has been published in, in a lot of uh, top journals. His current research focuses on the impact of geography on the long run evolution of economic and political institutions and the political conditions under which societies sustain intellectual property systems that promote innovation. Richard John is a professor of history and communication at Columbia University. He specializes in the history of business, technology, communications, and American political development. He teaches and advises graduate students in, at Columbia University PhD program in communication, and is a member of the core faculty of the Columbia History Department, where he teaches courses on the history of capitalism and the history of communications. His publications include many essays, eight edited books, and two award-winning monographs. Now, I will turn over to Steve and then Richard, and uh, let me start by two things. Number one, remind everybody that uh, we are live and recording, so uh, everything you said is gonna remain there forever. And two, um, I cannot be in better company to discuss a topic which is very dear to me, the connection between uh, uh, monopoly and uh, uh, politics in general. And in particular, in the other pieces of this series, we have discussed to what extent uh, the uh, monopolization of a certain part of the industry or the entire industry in Germany, for example, or in Japan, uh, might have uh, facilitated, if not led, uh, the rise and the consolidation of uh, uh, dictatorship like the Nazi, Nazi dictatorship or uh, the nationalist uh, leadership in Japan. And the question that uh, I want to start with, with these two prominent scholars, is to what extent uh, this has been avoided in the United States? Actually, this has been avoided in the United States. To what extent is because there was less of a monopoly? To what extent is because we had a better antitrust tradition, to what extent uh, uh, the United States are different, the institutions are better or whatever. So um, that's what uh, the first question I asked to both of you, and then uh, we'll go move from there. So Steve, why don't you start? Okay, um, thank you, Luigi. And I, let me just say how delighted I am to be participating uh, in this webinar of the Stigler Center and to be joining uh, you and Richard. Um, you know, the question of do monopolies increase political centralization or the centralization of political power increase its probability, or does the centralization of political power increase the probability of monopoly? In some ways, like asking, are rabbits fast because coyotes chase them, or are coyotes wily because they hunt rabbits? And the answer is that there are conditions that push the evolution of institutions, just like in the, in the case of rabbits and coyotes. It isn't that one causes the other. It's that there are conditions that push a system to evolve in a particular direction, such that some places have lots of fast rabbits and smart coyotes, and some have none. The US. I would advance the hypothesis that one of the reasons why we have neither 
monopolies that were powerful enough to push political centralization or politically centralized authority that was powerful enough to permit monopoly is because there were some basic factors characteristic of the United States, even in the colonial period, that pushed against centralization of either economic or political power. Uh, some of them are, are deeply cultural, and some of them are reflected in fundament, the fundamental organization of the American political and economic system. Amongst the cultural things I would point to is, for example, the use of the word boss, which is now the common parlance that uh, to which people refer to the, the person above them in a hierarchy. Boss isn't actually an English word. Boss is a Dutch word. And it was adopted in the mid 18th century by uh, American uh, common folk because they, did, they refused to address their patrons as master, which was the appropriate term uh, used in England. And so there was this sort of already in the 18th century, a reluctance um, to defer to authority and power. One of the, one of the political reflections uh, of the push against centralization of either economic or political power in the colonial period is the creation of assemblies, which go all the way back to the 1630s, um, which, uh, which, in which, in fact, they invented the right to vote on the spot. Um, essentially, what people did was give each other proxies to represent them at assembly meetings. So they created representative government on the fly. One of the, so when you get to independence, it's clear that there's going to be suffrage, mass suffrage, and it's clear that there's going to be a federal system. And it's clear that within the states, there are going to be municipalities. And so right from the very beginning, there is a, unlike, just about any other country I know, there is a decentralization of political power such that the states are more powerful uh, it, than the federal government all the way up until World War II in terms of the resources they control. And the municipalities control substantial independent resources independent of the states. That means that centralizing anything is simply really hard. Just as the centralization of political power is difficult, the centralization of economic power is also difficult. There are many competing, um, one might call them ecosystems in the US, right from the very beginning. The New York-Philadelphia split goes all the way back to the 18th century. And so right from roughly 1800, you already have Boston versus New York, uh, Philadelphia versus New York, uh, Baltimore versus Philadelphia. Uh, and then by the mid 19th century, you can add Chicago and Cleveland, all of which have their own business elites, all of them operating inside a, um, um, a political system that's pushing towards decentralization. So I think that it just, it has to do with the basic way that the US got put together from the very, very beginning, that it set it down a path in which it's just very hard to concentrate anything. Thank you, Steve. This is uh, great. Richard, what do you think? Well, thanks, Luigi, for uh, inviting me. And thank you, Steve, for joining me. It's always an honor and a privilege uh, to be at the Stigler Center. Um, since we're in the 18th century, um, let me just make a couple of observations that are, are pretty complementary to what Steve has suggested. Uh, if you read the documents of the founding generation, which I've actually been doing in the last couple of months, 
and you ask, how did the founding generation think about monopoly? Monopoly to the founding generation primarily was the British commercial system. It was the monopoly of trade that the British government maintained by virtue of laws, by virtue of navy, by virtue of political control. And we were throwing off monopoly with the establishment of the United States. So the United States was born of an, in an anti-monopoly moment, and it was born in a principled hostility opposition to monopolistic institutions, not just the East India Company, which after all was the organization that was trying to unload the tea that led to the Boston Tea Party, 1773, but the entire British commercial system. And it's an extraordinary fact that there are no founders of the United States, not George Washington, certainly not John Adams or Thomas Jefferson, and not even Alexander Hamilton, who supported monopoly in principle. They were all opposed to monopoly. Well, you'd ask, well, what about the banking system? Well, we had nascent national banking institutions, but as Steve knows better than I do, they were very limited. So yes, we have a decentralized federal polity. And one point that Steve made, I think that is easily overlooked, is the importance of municipalities. My colleagues who are, are right about anti-monopoly in the 19th century uh, are very interested in, in states and in, in, in the famous railroad case with Mon, we're challenging uh, the ability of, uh, of corporations to hide behind state law, to, to use the Supreme Court in order, to, in order to buttress certain kinds of authority. That's all well and good. But inside the big cities, and it was in the big cities in the period between the 1880s and the 19-teens, where an awful lot of institutional innovations occurred. Streetcars, electric power, uh, telephone, gas. It's in the cities that you get a principled defense of municipal franchises as monopoly institutions, and then as public utility. Public utility, that is to say, an institution in which competition is foreclosed by principle. And that's where you'd look, I think, if you want to find the defense of monopoly in the early 20th century, but it was bound up with the presumption that, well, if you're going to have limits on entry, then you have to provide certain kinds of services at certain rates. So that's an exception. Another exception, of course, the late 19th century is the emergence of the so-called natural monopolies, tel telegraph being the, the most famous example in the 1880s. But there also, it was considered to be exceptional considered to be unusual, and bizarrely perhaps from a present day perspective, the, uh, the reform-minded uh, elites, including many public figures, Ulysses S. Grant among them, were of the belief that if the telegraph network could not be coordinated through competition, then the network should be owned and operated by the federal government. So a government uh, kind of consolidated enterprise telegraph network was not the kind of monopoly that was threatening in the 1880s to business, elite, business elites who were using the telegraph and, in fact, and, and to uh, farm groups and labor groups. In fact, it's very difficult to find principal defenders of Western Union in the 1880s. One of the only principal defenders of Western Union that I have run across was Alfred Chandler, the grandfather of the business historian, who defended Western Union against regulation or ownership. But that was an eccentric view. The naturalizing of the corporation as a powerful aggregate, standard oil, let's say, as an example, or, or United States steel, that would come in the 20th century. In the 19th century, there was a great fear of consolidated economic enterprise. And just as Steve suggested that we, uh, we, we responded to that fear by uh, sustaining a decentralized polity. Only when that became impossible for technological, economic reasons, and indeed for political and cultural reasons that we might want to talk about, do you have these huge aggregates, and then you have the emergence of uh, the modern 
antitrust movement and the efforts to regulate uh, big business. If I could add uh, a, a point to something that Richard uh, just made uh, about the 19th century and about corporations. Um, you know, almost everything today takes a corporate form in the United States of one variety uh, or another. Um, and we take that for granted. And one of the really interesting features of the United, uh, of the United States is that up until the 19th century, all corporate charters everywhere were special acts of parliament or legislatures or decrees of kings to give limited liability as a privilege to a particular group of people, often in exchange for some other favor, often money. Right. The United States in 1811 pioneers the modern form of the corporation, which is the general incorporation law of New York State in 1811 where it becomes an administrative act. And so the corporate form becomes open to everybody in New York. And then New York, everybody, other states start to copy New York's general incorporation law, such that pretty soon it takes oh, maybe two decades for general incorporation, that is incorporation is essentially as a right, not as a privilege not an exchange for anything, to spread everywhere uh, in the U.S. such that today, um, you know, virtually everything, uh, including my dentist's office, is organized as a corporation. That makes the U.S. really unusual and again pushes back against the, the tendency towards monopoly because you can't create a barrier to entry through a privilege called limited liability joint stock company. It's open to everybody. Can I pick up on that, Luigi? Please, please. Um, because the general incorporation is so important, but its consequences in sectors where it was hard to sustain competition became enormously perplexing. I'll give you an example. 1848, New York extends the principle of general incorporation to telegraph. And you have a period of competition between telegraph corporations, 1848, 1866. 1866, John Sherman, observing the enormous power of Western Union, puts his support behind one of the first great anti-monopoly laws, which is the National Telegraph Act, 1866. That act provides special privileges for firms competing with Western Union, special benefits, access to rights of way, and so on. You don't have, don't have to worry about the provisions. What happened by 1881, however, was that the competition, which was intense, between rival telegraph companies that was created, sustained by the 1848 Act and the 1866 Act, that led to a situation where a single dominant telegraph network provider emerged, Western Union, under Jay Gould. And it was that moment in 1881 that business elites, especially wholesalers and merchants, long distance trade, came to recognize that general incorporation is not a solution in certain sectors, with telegraphy being among them. And that led to the movement to regulate those network uh, industries, or to find some way to make them responsible, responsive to the government movement for government ownership, which was actually written into the 1866 Act, and it was supported by Ulysses S. Grant. Long before socialists got interested in nationalizing enterprise, public figures, business leaders were in favor of nationalizing the telegraph, as had occurred in, John, in uh, Great Britain with John Stuart Mill's blessing and Jevons' blessing, because competition wouldn't work as a regulator. And that's one of the real challenges in the 19th century in thinking about these sectors where competition is not effective. And it was recognized as not effective by participants on the ground, not a theoretical matter, but a practical matter. 
So I cannot resist this. Uh, this is, seems to be done on purpose, but uh, is it an accident that I have actually a beautiful slide about Jay Gould. Uh, this is from uh, the Pack magazine that was a satirical magazine of the time. And where you see Jay Gould uh, that is swinging uh, with a telegraph, this is the telegraph line that he controls. And in the process of swinging with the telephone line, he's choking two pillars. One is the press because he controls information and the other is commerce. And this is uh, the stock exchange, manufacturing, et cetera, because he controls all the information, okay? And when I, when I present this to my students, I actually replace here this picture with uh, maybe uh, Mark Zuckerberg or uh, whoever is now the, the controller of Google, uh, because this uh, reminds very much of, uh, of uh, those times. And, and so going back to our debate, I think that uh, one interesting issue is that both of you found uh, very compelling stories for why in the past the United States were kind of uh, uh, immunized against the risk of uh, excessive concentration, political and uh, um, economical. But my fear is that this immunization might have uh, kind of uh, lost some of its effect. And uh, for two reasons, number one, the, the long cultural tradition of fighting against uh, the, the British monopolies is long gone. Uh, but even the decentralized nature of the US government is long gone in the sense uh, today the federal government controls most of the resources. Today states are begging money from the government because uh, the government is uh, the central government, the federal government is over overarching power. And uh, we do have uh, a very concentrated business elite. In the old days, uh, people in New York hardly knew who was in San Francisco. Now the business elite had a house in New York, one in San Francisco, and probably one in Washington, just in case they need to lobby. So they, they, it's the same elite everywhere. So um, aren't we now running the risk of being in a situation that uh, I don't want to be too dramatic, but resemble uh, the Germany of the 1920s or the Japan of the 1920s. Steve. Well, so you raised a, a really interesting issue, and it goes to the heart of the heart of a, actually a, a theory question in economics, and that is, what do we mean by monopoly? So, if one points to Facebook or Google or Apple, uh, all of which, in fact, are within a stone's throw of my house, um, and ask, are they monopolies? Well, it is certainly the case that they are very large. It's certainly the case that Facebook and Google maintain platforms that have network externalities, much like Richard was pointing out about Western Union. Um, the question is whether there are monopolies and whether, so there's a sort of two separate questions. One is a question of what do we mean by monopoly? And the other is what do we mean by an entity that may control information that is not and therefore is not in the public interest. Last time I checked, there was a technical definition in every economics textbook that I know of about what a monopoly is. And that is that it's able to earn the famous learner margin. It's able to constrain output in order to raise price. The key to the monopoly is not the size of the firm, it's the lack of substitutes. So for um, people who are watching this, who, who are trying to wrap their head around, well, what exactly does a monopoly mean? I would say if you've ever been to a baseball game and bought a hot dog or been to a movie theater and bought a bucket of popcorn for $10, you have experienced a monopoly. It's a local monopoly. But you see, you, you know, there's the, you can't pop your own popcorn in the movie theater and you can't roast your own hot dogs and stands. 
And so what a monopoly is, is a, um, uh, the lack of substitutes that allows a firm to constrain output and raise prices. I don't know whether that is the business model of the big platforms that we see today, like Google or Facebook or Twitter. Um, now that that I, I that doesn't seem to me to be what they do. Rather, it seems to me that they are earning not monopoly rents or market power rents. They're earning Ricardian rents from having a better product than their competitors. And what you've raised, Luigi, is the question of, do we need to rethink the anti-monopoly laws or the antitrust laws in the United States and have a different theory about what a large firm operating not in the public interest would look like? But this doesn't seem to me to be the, a monopoly in the, in the, the common understanding uh, of the word. It also raises the question, you know, one of the, one of the concerns about monopoly that has been in, with the U.S. from the very beginning is not just concentration of economic power, it's concentration of political power. And again, you know, the key to a monopoly or the concentration of anything is the lack of a substitute. So when we were talking, uh, I think it was a week or so ago, Richard, John, and uh, Richard and, and, and you and I, one of the things that Richard mentioned, uh, I perhaps have this wrong, is that um, the substitute that FDR used against the uh, monopoly of the newspapers was radio. And the substitute that Donald Trump, whether you like him or not, uses against uh, Facebook and Google is Twitter. And so the existence of multiple platforms um, creates substitutes that allows for a substitute, allows there to, to it, it works against the concentration of influence. But I'm, I advance this as an hypothesis rather than as a statement of fact. Could I jump in there, Luigi? Please, Richard, it's your turn. Yeah. Um, Steve, that's a, that's a very lucid presentation of monopoly as it's come to be understood really from the mid 20th century onward. But Luigi, if we go back to that uh, Jay Gould cartoon, if you want to put it up again, I'll point out a feature of it that even you may not be familiar with. Can you get it up again? Sure. Let's Let me try my technological features that are limited. But yeah, let's, let me try again. On the spot. Okay. There you go. Let's look at what's in Jay Gould's pockets. Those are two New York Associated Press newspapers. If you gain control of four New York Associated Press newspapers, you are in control of the entire news brokerage business in the country. Gould already controlled the New York Tribune and he has the New York World. So the understanding of the founders, the understanding of this very talented cartoonist Kepler and the many business uh, and journalistic uh, elites who, who, he is, who he is in dialogue with is a monopoly as a form of domination. That's the traditional understanding, it's political, and economic, and there is no ready substitute. Now, I agree with Steve that in many instances, substitutes will emerge. In many instances, competition will somehow reassert itself. But if you look at this cartoon, just focus on it in the 1880s, there was a widespread perception that not only news, but also the infrastructure for the circulation of news was being controlled by a single individual at the behest of a corporation in which he had a dominant ownership position. And it seems to me that that's closer to the kind of concerns we have today about Google and Facebook than worrying about their business model. The concern with the Western Union was not really primarily rates too high, rates too low. It was the power 
that it could wield through its control of the press over public debate, over the issuance of stock shares. It could manipulate the polity. That's what well-informed contemporaries feared. And that's why the founders were so troubled by the British commercial system and the East India Company. Those are the kinds of issues I think that we're confronting today. And what I find so revealing in Steve's comments was that the world he's describing is a relatively recent world, 20th century or mid 20th century onward, where we've, we've developed this almost desiccated understanding of what monopoly is that makes it hard for us to connect not only with the founders, but with the many reform minded folk who were troubled by media consolidation, who were troubled by fake news, who were troubled by the intentional manipulation of the public for gain, not simply narrow economic gain, but also political gain. And that, that's, a, that's a subject we could, we, could, we could talk about a little bit more, how monopolies distort the circulation of information on public affairs. I wonder and, if and I thank, can no, thank you, Richard. Just one second, please. Thank you, Richard, because I think that you put in focus exactly what uh, this talk is about and exactly what the conference that the Stiga Center had organized for the 15th of May, which has been postponed because of COVID, but it will be uh, done because I think that the fundamental question we're trying to address is there's no doubt that the intellectual tradition of the United States changed in the middle of the 20th century and the so-called Chicago School had a big role in changing that intellectual tradition and uh, uh, went for a narrower definition, much more precise and much more uh, administrable in many, many dimensions. And, and the question is, uh, in doing so, have we left out something important and should we resurrect it, uh, resurrect it maintaining one of the tenants of the Chicago School, which is we need to have this stuff administrable because the problem is that if you make something too vague and too subjective, cannot be subjected itself to the rule of law. So the question that uh, uh, this series of seminars and more broadly, the conference that we are still planning to have is, can we have a political antitrust in the sense not determined by politics, but looking at power rather than, than just uh, higher prices um, in a way that is administrable. And then uh, let me ask a question to Steve with an example. So during the uh, last uh, uh, presidential primaries, uh, people have noticed that uh, depending on who was sending uh, the email, Google was, uh, Gmail was uh, putting uh, your announcement in the span or in the, in the main sort of uh, 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 inbox. And, uh, and maybe this is uh, driven by too many conspiracy theory, but if you are Buttigieg, 100% uh, of your email were getting through. If you are Elizabeth Warren, that surprise, surprise was against, uh, or was to break up Google, uh, your email ended up uh, in the folder 90% of the time. So are you concerned about this thing, Steve? So the short answer is yes, I am concerned. Um, I don't want to, I, I want to be understood as not defending concentration of economic or political power. The question is how you defy, how do you know when you have it and what should you do about it? And so there are basically two answers to the question of how do you know when you have it and two answers to what do you do about it. The answer which emerged in the 20th century to the question about how do you know when you have a monopoly is that you look for evidence of monopoly pricing because it's, it's a, um, um, an observable implication of a theory. You can have it or you cannot have it. And so it, it removes a degree of subjectivity or discretion 
from a political authority that might want to punish a rival uh, who, who themselves might want to concentrate um, access to information. So the so defining a monopoly in the other way is any big company I don't like, right, in, is an invitation for government to abuse its authority and power. And that's also a form of monopolization that cannot be good for the common wheel. So there's a, so we came to, in the 20th century, an administrable system of what a monopoly is. Now the question is that once you would have a monopoly defined in either way, uh, either any big firm that I don't like or um, any, uh, or firm that's earning uh, rents, uh, market power rents, then the question is what do you do? And so one answer is, well, government should break it up. Government should regulate. Uh, government should um, uh, force the firm to shed pieces of the enterprise. The other answer is, well, what would promote a substitute? Or is there a reason why a substitute will not endogenously emerge from the market? So if we go back to the 19th century example, let's say of Jay Gould, he's got two New York newspapers in his pocket. There was a newspaper in New York that I'm surprised that he didn't, I'm not surprised, I actually know, he didn't control, it's the New York Times. And so the New York Times, and Richard knows way more about this than I do, so I'm gonna to defer to him. But my understanding is that the New York Times emerges as uh, an alternative to a substitute for Jay Gould's control of two newspapers. Uh, and its motto, all the news that's fit to print, is a rebuttal of uh, the notion that what newspapers do is advocate for their owner. So in the 19th century, nobody believed that journalism was about the facts. Um, this was, these were clearly seen as, you know, what we would now call the yellow journalism. Um, the, the response to the concentration, Gould's concentration of information was the emergence of a substitute uh, now called the New York Times, or it was called the New York Times. So one, there's two ways to address a monopoly, however you define it. One is the government should step in, which creates the threat that the government will monopolize. Um, I, as you know, I spent a lot of time in countries where that's what, in fact, the government does. And that's what actually drew me into uh, academia in the first place was an interest in how this happens. Uh, and, the sec uh, and then the second is, well, you can use the, mar the market if the institutions are right, can endogenously respond. And one of the really interesting things about the United States, and this comes out in Naomi Lamro's book, uh, I think it's called The Great Merger Movement, um, is that the capital markets could finance rival firms that is create substitutes. So to the question, this particular question, let's say about Google, Facebook, yes, they are very big. Yes, they are platforms. Um, yes, um, there is the potential, especially if we require them to censor, uh, that they will censor. Um, they may prefer some messages over others, but there is always looming out there the prospect of a substitute. Uh, financed by the capital market. And so the question I think before is, is do we ask the government to do it or do we rely on the market to do it? So, so yeah, um, you raised some interesting uh, points. Uh, okay, by and by, everything would work out. Kind of in the long run, we're all dead. To keep to the 1880s analogy with Luigi's observation about Buttigieg and Warren, the Western Union had entered into contractual arrangements with the New York Associated Press newspapers to not criticize Western Union. So the, the market for information was controlled 
contemporaries would have said it's monopolized. And it isn't just any two newspapers that Gould has. He has two of the four New York Associated Press newspapers. So even if he didn't get the Times, which was one of the seven, he could have controlled, at least this was the perception, the entire news ecology. That is to say, not an individual newspaper with yellow journalism as a particular view, but the entire ecology. I think that's the issue that we're concerned about today with Google and Facebook, and access to information. Now, what do you do about it if that's your concern? Well, in the 1930s, there was a whole school of economists, uh, institutionalists, who contended the one kind of monopoly that the government sanctions is intellectual property, the patent rights. So what we should do if we want to challenge these behemoths, and they were by that time many, you had them in communications, you had them in electric power, you had them in chemicals, and so on, is that we should find a way to oblige them to open their vaults, make intellectual property uh, accessible to others. So that's, a, that's an anti-monopoly solution that's based on the fundamental assumption about monopoly, which is it is a, a, it's a privilege guaranteed by the state against others, intellectual property. So that's one place we could go in 1930s and 40s that might be relevant to Google and Facebook today. But I would push back a little bit on the idea that anyone could start a newspaper in the 1880s or that the informational environment was somehow free from systemic bias because that was certainly not the perception of the new yorkers who were concerned about western union and that's not the perception of, of farm groups of, uh, of labor groups who recognize systemic biases and the challenge they have in getting their uh getting their message across so yes, capital markets can provide opportunity. Gould took advantage of his own capital to sponsor uh, inventors in the 1870s. And out of the competition between Alexander Graham Bell and, uh, and, and uh, Thomas Edison came the telephone, the, the uh, sound recording, that is to say the record player, uh, the multiplex and electric power, intense competition between rivals, capital markets. But that was a kind of competition that ceased to be important after Gould took over Western Union. Almost no innovation in the American telegraph sector after that time. Astonishing. Compare it with the British telegraph sector where they're inventing electrical engineering to man the cables. So you could have a situation where competitive capital, new entrants, are not able for structural reasons to solve the problems that we both agree can occur with domination of a center firm. And that, that would be my caveat. But I know, Luigi, you want to get us to the 20th century. Actually, no, no, I, 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 fast. go ahead, Steve. I, I wonder if I could pursue something about the 20th century that Richard uh, has raised. There is an extremely interesting paper about this issue of the use of antitrust enforcement through the patent system to discourage monopoly by a, a, a law professor at USC, Jonathan Barnett. Uh, if you, if uh, listeners go onto his website, I'm sure they can find the paper. And one of the things that, so there's sort of two issues here. The first is we should be very clear that in fact, the patent is not a grant of monopoly. It is often cast that way in a very loose definition of monopoly. If, so think about this for a minute. There are millions upon millions of patents in, in the United States. There are hundreds of thousands of patents in just about any complicated project, uh, complicated device uh, that you own, for example, your cell phone, this computer, your automobile, if those were actually grants of monopoly and you had monopoly stacked upon monopoly, what it would be amazing that anything would even work or exist, right? There's, the estimates on a cell phone is there may be 100 to 200,000 patents in it. So 
if they were really monopolies, if each patent was a monopoly, the cell phone would cost, you know, some orders of magnitude more than it does. Yeah, one of the points of the Barnett paper is that when the government tried to control monopoly by forcing large firms to share their intellectual property, it did not actually have the effect of increasing competition. And it's because the, it, 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 the heart of this is, is the intellectual property is not itself the source of the monopoly. The source of the monopoly came from other features of those firms, some of which, and I'm going to be careful to not call them monopolies now, some of which were simply that they provided a better product at a lower price than a potential competitor. So their rents were Ricardian, not market power. Um, but the, the point I simply want to make here is that, quote, opening up, forcing firms to give away their intellectual property may not actually be the key to this. Um, if you believe that there is a, that there is a genuine problem, it also posits a counterfactual world in which you have to ask, okay, you know, one of the things about technology is we always like to believe that whatever the state of technology is today is the end. There'll be nothing new coming along. Um, you know, had we gone back, I don't know, 20 years ago, could anybody have imagined Facebook and Google? And I think the answer is probably no. Um, and so the, that, that, fallacy of imagining that we are at the end of technological development assumes, well, it, it assumes that we're at that end and that there's a counterfactual world in which completely, uh, in which a patent-free world would give you a more diffuse organization of the information business. It might, it also might not. Um, there are lots of ways to concentrate and uh, um, intellectual property is not the only one. And in fact, probably is not one of the major sources of it. It's the nature of the, that, that these are platforms that people voluntarily use. They're choosing them. Now, why they choose them is another question. Um, it's... But that's, that's a... I, I have to cut you off because number one, I want to give everybody the opportunity to uh, intervene and we have a lot of questions online. But second, on the voluntarily use of some platform, I didn't choose to uh, have Zoom. My school forced me to use Zoom. I, and uh, if you have children in, uh, in middle school, you're forced to be on the Facebook page because otherwise you don't know anything about what happens in your kid's class. So I think that uh, you can choose in, in the tw beginning of the 20th century, you could choose not to have a phone. Good luck if you want to live in a modern society. Uh, you can choose not to be on an email system. Uh, let's see next time you got a job. So I think that, uh, uh, anyway, uh, but let me uh, open to question. And uh, we have a question from Ravi Jagannathan that uh, say there is a subtle difference between Facebook and newspapers. Journalists write in newspapers what appears in newspapers is decided on by the editors. Almost anyone can express their views on Facebook, and those who have better ability to manipulate public opinion can use Facebook. Doesn't mean Facebook owners use Facebook to manipulate public opinion. That doesn't make Facebook a monopoly or concentration of economic power in the hands of Facebook owners. Richard, what do you think about that? So the issue is the distinction between Facebook as a network and Facebook as a as a media uh, a, a media source or a media focus. I think it's misleading for Facebook to do two things at once. The, the corporation one to contend that they have no liability for anything that goes out over Facebook, and that's been codified in federal law, uh, Section two hundred and thirty, which is now in the news. Which the president has brought it up in the last couple of days. To contend and to contend on the other hand, they're not responsible 
and then to contend on the other hand that it's it's necessary or important for them to exercise some kind of oversight and there is a, there's a tension and a, a kind of an uncertainty there that i believe is going to be unsustainable in the long term and it's unsustainable for this reason when newspapers were central to the media ecology say up through the 1990s or even the 2000 aughts they had a secure source of income and so they were relatively decentralized in steve's terms and we agree about this and the importance of decentralization they've lost a lot of that revenue now because their advertising has been taken over by facebook which is massively consolidated uh the the ways in which the 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 advertising market works. And as a consequence, it's much harder for journalists to maintain that kind of, the kind of staffing and the kind of independence that they need in order to provide news as a civic good, as the founders would have understood it. So the idea that Facebook can have it both ways, I think, is a problem. And I think that's why there's mounting political pressure to do something about it, because ordinary people recognize the challenge that is posed by a network that is a platform that is so pervasive, as you described, my daughter uses it, and yet one that has such power over what we see and what we don't see. So we have another question which is related, which I will address to Steve so that he can also answer the previous one. And so, we're living, this is uh, Gaurav Kumar, we're living in a very different time from 100 years ago. How Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc., use information is to a large extent transparent and clear. Uh, they're both networks and means of sharing information rather than generating information. Mm -hmm. Additionally, they are generating significant value for both consumer and producer in the economy and society as well mm -hmm. as fostering innovation. These issues and problems are very different from those seen historically and deems, uh, uh, and, and deems different and creative solutions. We discuss breaking up companies, removing patent protection, and over-regulating as probable solutions. Not sure if those solutions are applicable in these times. So I'm not so sure whether there was a question or a statement, but uh, Steve, why don't you elaborate on this and also maybe answer the previous question? So let me see if I can uh, combine them. So I, I think that both of these are really crucial questions. Um, I think that the, the point about Facebook and Google being different from Jay Gould's newspapers is important. They are not, they produce some information, but they are platforms for people to share information. That means that they um, are, are different uh, in type. The question of who's getting the surplus produced by Facebook, Google, Amazon is a really good question. So let's take Amazon as an example. Um, in any thing that I want to buy, there is a substitute for Amazon. Um, I don't have to use Amazon as, as the platform to buy a bag of screws or um, a, a lamp or whatever it is I'm buying. There's, there's substitutes. One of the claims that's made against Amazon is that it charges low prices and undercuts what the substitutes charge. Well, now we've just, we've just moved away from the definition of a monopoly as understood in the 20th century in the United States because the surplus is being captured by consumers, not by, not by the corporation called Amazon. That may well be, it's an empirical question for Facebook and Google as to whether or not they're, the surplus they're creating it, who's capturing it? Certainly they capture some of it because they have significant ad revenues. But there's also got to be a portion of the surplus that they're creating by lowering the cost of information to 
the rest of society. So there's consumer surplus that's being generated and captured. There is one particular feature of them that I do find somewhat worrisome. And that is that what you see is a function of what you wanted to look at before, as I understand the way these systems work. So if I click on certain kinds of news stories, I'm more likely, as I understand how these systems work, and I'm ha happy to be wrong. You know, I, I, I'm in my 60s, so what I, what I know about, you know, uh, IT uh, is constrained. But as I understand them, you're, what, one of their features is that they, the AI uh, in, in these systems wants to feed me things that it thinks I want to see. And so that means it's going to reinforce whatever views I already have. That strikes me as something that's not positive. That it uh, it creates it has it has accelerated or it's in, if I'm correct it's in, it's intensified the echo chamber of American politics um, and encour encouraged in a funny way less listening to the other side. But that's a separate issue from consumer whether there's consumer surplus created. Clearly there is, um, so I'll stop there. But I would like to point out one fact uh, that I think is inaccurate that Ravi Jagannathan in his question pointed out. He, he makes a difference between the editor of a newspaper and Facebook that in his view does not edit anything. And uh, actually this is wrong because one of the main functions of a newspaper editor is to pick where something is published. Uh, if I put a news in the front page, everybody reads it. If I put it in page 55 in small type setting, nobody reads it. Okay, and that's what a lot of editors actually do. The disturbing news generally are published, but are published in page 17 uh, behind uh, some uh, ads and obscure by uh, the common view. And that's exactly what Facebook does because Facebook promotes to Steve or to Richard or to me some news and not some others. Uh, promote some posts and not others. Now, what is their objective function in this promotion? Their objective function is to make money, uh, which is a very legitimate objective. But as a result, they have, they have experimental evidence suggesting that uh, if I titillate Steve with a news that is in his view of thoughts, but a bit more extreme, he might be more likely to look at it. And so, uh, you start reading about uh, maybe uh, conservatives and you end up about neo-Nazi group in Illinois. Uh, and, uh, or you start with uh, uh, some conspiracy theory and you end up with uh, whatever. So I think that that's part of what Facebook does. This is editorial policy. And as Steve was saying, right. this has massive consequences because the reason why we have this uh, uh, escalation of uh, uh, polarization is in part due to the fact that we have fed what we like but on steroids and in a way that uh, forces us to stay more on the platform. So, I, I, is, well, go ahead. so I, I agree. So that's the, that's the dilemma. Steve and I both, I think, are enthusiasts for decentralization, for many voices, for mm -hmm. opportunity. But Facebook, just to, and, and Google, but let, ha, have an incentive, particularly Facebook, which is a specific incentive to make money to keep your eyeballs on the screen while they're contending that they're not responsible for what goes on. So that is a very specific, not only an editorial function, but it's a commercial function that means they are able to capture rents, as it were, to use Kairakari, it's being generated elsewhere in the economy. In our, if we look back beyond the relatively limited period of time when we've supported the consumer welfare standard, which is completely alien to the founders and completely alien to the period when American economic history was really the most uh, vibrant between 1880 and 1940, right? If we, if, we, if we go before that, 
we recognize the importance of segmenting markets as a principle so that, for example, telegraph and telephone will be separate from each other. You're not going to control the, the creation of news, advertising of news, circulation of news. That principle of segmentation, and I'm, I'm, more, simple, I, I'm more convinced that um, pat, opening the patent vaults are important, the 56 uh, Bell consent decree, Al Chandler, no slouch as a business historian, said that was an absolutely critical event in the emergence of consumer electronics globally, right? That kind of segmentation has historically proved vital, not only to innovation, but also to the promotion of a decentralized political economy that Steve's written about so much. That's what worries me about Google and, and Facebook, because we see the magnitude of the problem in our own day, and I don't think that we could get around it by simply saying they're giving the people what the people want, because we have an obligation in a republic to provide the citizenry with the information that the citizenry needs. That's in keeping with the vision of the founders, and that's in keeping with the vision of the statesmen who were in charge when this country was an economic powerhouse, 1880s, 1940s, as opposed to the present moment, but it looks like we're in decline. So I okay, I, I stop you here also because we're running out of time. Uh, uh, two things: one is you're bringing up an excellent topic, and I think I should have you back in a spiller debate about uh, intellectual property, intellectual monopolies, and the impact that this has. I think that's a very important topic. We're not going to resolve in the one minute we have left. In the one minute we have left, I have the one last question, and I give you. Uh, 20 seconds each to reply. This is from Lucas Gabriela de, da Mota. They say, recently I heard a podcast, Big Brain with Professor Zingales, about Google and Facebook being potential threat to democracy. In retrospective, it seems right to say that the US has been an exceptional case compared to the other countries in terms of avoiding monopolies and any kind of dictatorship over the 1990s. Considering that now we are aware of some potential situation in which big tech companies may have the ability to influence election, what are your views and perspective for the United States in the future, considering a scenario in which Google, Facebook, etc., remain unchallenged in terms of economic power and control of information? In 20 seconds, Steve. <laughs> okay, very quickly. I I'm, I'm a big fan of this, I hope it's clear, of decentralization and a decentralized ecology because it promotes uh, independent thinking and it promotes competition. The question is, what is the right set of policies to promote a decentralized um, decentralization, many voices? There are basically only two ways to do this. You either rely on the market to provide substitutes or you have the government break up the centralized, uh, a centralized platform or you create a government centralized platform. All three of those, the last two of those also present a danger to democracy. So a government platform is now going to be controlled by the government. I don't know that I like that any better than I like um, a private entity uh, having control of the network. The other is if you have a government mandated breakup, is the enterprise actually viable? Keep in mind that what we observe now as Google and Facebook were entities that emerged over time um, out of processes of trial and error in which other models, business models got sorted out, that is, failed. And so, the, you know, there's a, there's a serious question, and I, I don't pretend to have the answer to it. But a serious question of if you broke them up, is it in fact possible to break them up into something that is viable as a business? Richard. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, three quick points. First, if we ask 
what's the wisdom of statesmen in the past? We have segmented. The telephone business was not able to get into the radio business. In 56, telephone was kept out of computers. That's how we have promoted innovation in the past, promoted the public good, segmentation. Facebook, Google can be segmented under law, not just break them up, but segment. You can get into certain markets and not into others and open up the vaults so there can be more transparency for the kind of decisions, algorithms, and so on. The second is this question of corporations versus government. For much of our history, corporations were much more threatening than government. Uh, subways, public. Post office, public. Only in the 20th century have we come to demonize government as opposed to corporation, infrastructure. Regulated government institutions, public utilities, work pretty well in our history. Uh, exceptions, but that's the second. Segmentation uh, is the first, and that's the second. And, and the third is, I just want to return to this question of intellectual property. Google and Facebook are big and powerful because they took advantages. They took advantage of infrastructure generated by the government, part of the Cold War. I think that needs to be part of the discussion. These are institutions that should be promoting the public good. Luigi has raised instances in which they're clearly not promoting the public good. They're leading to polarization. They're undermining our democratic experiment in self-government. And I think that's an issue that all citizens should be concerned about and willing to take action uh, with regard to. Perfect. With these uh, words of wisdom, I stop the debate here. I think that uh, you've both been great and provided uh, very important points on both sides of the issue. And uh, I thank the listeners and uh, uh, we're gonna see you next in uh, another of this series of debates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please enjoy. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Richard. That was great. It was fun. <laughs>